Hello, my uh, dear friends. I'm back here uh, having a conversation with Eddie Stern, um, my esteemed yoga teacher and also an expert on many aspects of the teachings of yoga. And we've been discussing the vibhutis and today we want to actually explore uh, two more of these. Uh, so let's get going. Eddie, uh, what's the first vibhuti you want to share today? Okay, so we are in chapter three and we're up to sutra number 25. And this one is by applying the effulgent light of the higher sense perception, which is called jyotishmati. Um, and again, the effulgent light is a light which is not caused by anything but shines on its own then the knowledge of subtle objects or things that are obstructed from view or placed at a great distance can be acquired or seen. So basically, by doing the samyama or the combination of dharana, dhyana, and samadhi on jyotishmati, the effulgent light, then um, the things that are obstructed from our view can be seen. And um, so basically, this is a sense perception about seeing not limited to the eyes. So how do we perceive things, um, but perceive them without having to use the physical eyes? And the commentary of Hari Harananda discusses that this, um, the revelation that comes from this type of a um, samyama is arising from the heart center, and that the jyotishmati itself arises from the heart center. So our perception of these unseen things is not limited to the buddhi or to our intellect or the you know the faculty of knowing but the revelation of the object comes from something which transcends the limiting factor of the intellect so this is how to perceive things without getting stuck in the confines of the intellect which is interpreting naming and categorizing things all the time um, but still to understand what the object is that we wish to see so, so uh, that the, is sutra. So I pass it to you. Okay, got it. And uh, here's uh, something I've been thinking about for a very long time. And uh, I want to share with you because I think uh, this particular practice uh, does have huge, huge, huge potential that uh, we haven't tapped on. So uh, the... Uh, practices dharna, dhyan, samadhi on what I was long time ago when I learned these sutras, the translation I was given was inner light. Would you say that's a good approximate uh, um, translation of this particular practice? Inner light, you're doing dharna, dhyan, samadhi on the inner light, the if self-effulgent light of awareness. I think that's fair to say. Okay. So let's assume that we're talking about the inner light, the self-effulgent light of awareness. And therefore, I actually have some very challenging ideas here to present. One is that we see uh, with the eyes. Um, you know, that's an assumption that everyone makes and you know it's reasonable when when your eyes are blocked you can't see and uh, <clears throat> we also assume that all seeing occurs uh, as a result of interaction with photons in fact we use the word photons in english to refer to all forms of light you know all forms of light from uh, x-rays to gamma rays to ultraviolet, to radio waves, to cosmic waves, to the cosmic wave background, and the entire electromagnetic field, uh, which includes actually at subatomic forces like strong and weak interactions, leave aside gravity, which is not an atomic entity, but otherwise, all experience comes through photons, is the assumption. Uh, so right now, as you're looking at me, photons are entering your eyes. They're causing um, chemical reactions in your retina. And then 
uh, there's an electrical impulse called an action potential that goes to your brain and voila, you see Eddie Stern in his studio, you see me, you see yourself in a mirror, you see objects, books, tables, everything. And here's where the conundrum is. Photons have none of those properties. Okay, photons have no color, no shape, no dimensionality, no mass. And yet we say that photons in one form or another are giving us the experience of the five senses. Um, because ultimately everything through the five senses is an electrical impulse, electrical information that goes from any one of the five senses. Now we're talking about the sense called seeing, but when you taste an orange, same thing. Uh, you know, electrochemical reactions interact with receptors, send uh, electro electricity to the brain. And electricity in one form or the other is all photons. So how do we get the experience then of colors and shapes and sounds and, and, and smells and uh, tastes and even ideas and thoughts and images and imagination? How do photons create that? So, you know, I've, I've struggled with this a lot and I've come to the conclusion that actually, while this is a very useful model, you know, you block the photons from entering, you can't see. You block the electrical information from your tongue to your brain and you can't taste. While that all is true, it actually does not explain experience at all. So, and furthermore, there's no experience in the brain whatsoever. It's only electrochemistry, which itself, if you look at that electrochemistry as a neural correlate on a scan, then that's an experience as well. It's all experience anyway, and yet photons do not explain any experience. So I like to turn this um, kind of upside down from where modern science is. And instead of saying that information is coming to us through the five senses, Actually, information and our ideas about information are projecting out through the five senses. And the five senses are not physical entities. They're modifications of the light of awareness that appear as colors, sounds, tastes, textures, images, feelings, thoughts on the screen of consciousness. So they are vrittis. And those vrittis give us then the concept of eyes and ears, which are instruments that are projecting the light of awareness, the inner light, the effulgent light, as the experience that we call mind, body, and universe. And then, you know, uh, I'm reminded of a beautiful uh, poem by um, William Blake, where he says, we are led to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye that was born in the night to perish in the night while the soul slept in beams of light. So when we look through the instruments of perception, and as you know, there are those are just modes, instruments of perception, just like the five senses are instruments of perception, but so is the mind an instrument of perception. So is the intellect, so is the ego, and so is the witness. These are the nine ways we know experience, nine ways. And behind all this is pure awareness, which is modifying itself into these nine modes of experience and, uh, and knowing. So with this sutra, what I understand is that actually pure awareness is modifying itself into the nine modes of experience. And they're all subtle, actually. Colors are... There's no such thing as color in the physical world. No such thing. There's no location for color in the physical world. There's no such thing as sound in the physical world. That all this is processed in awareness. And awareness by itself has no location. It has no form. It's infinite. It's borderless. So even this experience you and I are having is being pro processed outside of space-time. It's just projecting right now as this local experience. Once we understand that all experience is processed outside of space-time, 
including this experience we're happening now, then this sutra makes a lot of sense. Every experience is non-local. Some are so densely appearing localized, but they still appear on the screen of awareness, you know, like this sound, like this picture. And some are more subtle. I can close my eyes and see Eddie on the screen of my consciousness right now. Okay, I can close my eyes and hear Eddie's voice on the screen of my consciousness. So both subtle experiences that occur in the subtle body, including the experiences of the subtle body, mind, intellect, and ego, buddhi, ankar, uh, bud, ankar, buddhi, um, uh, what uh, is it called? Mano, buddhi, ankar. These are all modes of knowing. And then we shift our whole idea upside down. No outside world. There's no, as John Wheeler said, there's no out there, out there. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's a Milky Way galaxy out there or a starlit sky. It seems out there, but actually it's a combination of Rithis in awareness and goes along with the combination of Rithis, which we call the body. So this sutra opens the door to the awakening of non-local -dorm non dormant potentials which include everything from extrasensory perception, remote viewing, remote hearing, remote tasting, remote smelling, remote thinking, remote healing, remote hear, uh, I mentioned hearing, tasting, smelling, uh, extrasensory perception, but also precognition, future, past, all through the light of this effulgent awareness. So for me, this is a very favorite uh, sutra. Uh, doing dharana on the only light there is. And the only light there is, is the light of awareness. Photons, you know, I look at objects right now, and this is blue wavelength being reflected, according to science, but there's no blue going from here to my brain. Um, there's no blue from this going to my brain colorless photons, and those are ideas as well. Photons are ideas, the more they are vrittis themselves. So I, I find this particular sutra life affirming in that the light of awareness is you and you are the universe. So what do you think? Yeah, I think that that's very apt. It'd be hard to argue against that. Um, the One of the ideas in the sutra also is that um, the, the knowledge that we're gaining from this samyama is not restricted to sense perceptions. And um, I think that um, the, the way that you characterize the sense perceptions as well is, is very apt. And I think our sense organs, rather than being instruments of perception, they're really instruments of projection. That we're projecting these ideas that we formed based on whatever our upbringing, samskara, past karma, we are superimposing ideas on top of objects through the senses. And as soon as we have contact with, you know, say a phone, and um, before I didn't know what a phone is, now that, uh, now, I, now I know what a phone is, so I'm gonna form an idea about it. So even though the object exists as a discrete entity, not, of course, separate from all other material, but it exists. And now, through my sense organs, in um, combination with my intellect, I'm projecting an idea upon it. But the idea that I'm projecting upon it is going to be different than the idea that you or my daughter or a three-year-old is projecting upon that same phone, because there is no fixed reality in regards to the phone. It's simply a material object. So. And in Vedanta, especially Advaita Vedanta, we see this idea that the entire universe is a projection of Brahman. It projects out from Brahman. And therefore, everything in the projection, which means the manifestation, is also an amplification of that projection, but with smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller slivers of um, connection to reality. So um, my sense organs, are a projection also of Brahman, of the Absolute, and they can only perceive a very infinitesimally small sliver of reality because they're, they've come down in so many um, 
you know, they're so far away from, you could say, pure consciousness. So um, then what happens if we begin to not use our sense organs to gather information? What else can we use to gather information? Well, the light of awareness, as, as you've indicated. And, um, and then we're not getting lost in the projection, but we are maintaining contact with the thing that, um, that gives light or gives rise to all the other projections to exist. So, um, and, I, and I think Sankhya agrees with that in certain ways too, because in Sankhya we have Purusha, pure being, in Prakriti, which is na nature and the potential for manifestation. And then nature somehow begins to move within herself and um, then the gunas move out from an equilibrium. They start to overlap and then, then they create all the other forms. And after the gunas mix with each other, then um, cosmic intelligence appears in the universe and then cosmic identity, the universe knows itself as a separate entity. And then from there, things like the five elements come into being, the perceptions that the elements carry, the potential for seeing, for tasting, etc. And then um, the gunas also combine to make the mind. So in the mind, therefore, is a projection of the gunas. And then from the mind becomes the associated things that allow the mind to perceive, which are the sense organs and the organs of action. Further projections and engrossification of these subtle entities. So, so I thought you brought us very nicely sort of ba on a backward chain to awareness. And one other thing I wanted to say before we go on to the next sutra is that um, you talked about photons and, um, and photons don't carry experience and photons of course are also, uh, we can only see the light bouncing off of them in our realm but you can't see them where there's dark energy or dark matter. And this is actually one of the worlds that is discussed by Vyasa in the next sutra that he actually says that there are regions of the universe that are gross and subtle and um, there are certain areas of the universe that can't be illuminated um, and cannot be seen by gross material light. So there's echoes of, of what you were talking about there. So let's go on to the next sutra. No, no, before you, before you uh, go on to the next one, there are very important concepts here that you uh, mentioned, including the gunas and including you know, hidden um, realms of experience or possible experience, but you raise some very important points. So look at any model of reality right now. Um, let's look at the physicalist model. What is this book made of? Well, it's made of paper. Where did the paper come from? A tree. What's a tree? It's an entire forest ecosystem with birds and bees and butterflies and sunshine and earth and wind and air and the five elements. And what is that? What is that? It's atoms, molecules, force fields, and gravity. And uh, what is that? Uh, well, those are the activities of the universe. So this book is the universe appearing as a book. You are the universe appearing as a moving entity. The universe and every sentient being I see in New York City is the entire universe in a particular motion. This is looking at it through Western models, but look at it through Eastern models. And this is a perceptual activity, which is a vritti of awareness. So uh, awareness is of course the source of all experience. Uh, including the experience of the universe. So this is actually also the universe. Uh, no matter where you go, you're seeing the universe in a particular mode of um, mode of experience. Um, and so if the universe is Brahman and uh, it's the vibration of Brahman uh, consciousness, then uh, wherever you go, there's Brahman. Um, God is not difficult to find. God is impossible to avoid. Uh, even intellectually. So that's one thing that uh, comes very clear to me from these models that we are creating, that there is only the divine uh, pretending to be a book or, a, or an iPhone or, or uh, my spectacles or you or me or a tree or a star or a moon. It's something very reassuring that there is only the divine 
awareness, which is the light of awareness. So now let's go on to the second sutra we were going to discuss. Okay, great. And before we go on to the second, um, I wondered if you could, because we're talking about many different universes in the next one, if you could tell us how many stars, how many galaxies, how many planets, how many universes uh, there are in the known universe right now. I know you know these numbers. Yeah, yeah, they, these are easily available on the internet. So if you go Google, how many uh, universe, how many, um, how many stars there are? It's seven hundred six trillion stars. How many galaxies there are? Two trillion galaxies. How many planets there are? Uncountable trillions of planets, including possibly sixty billion habitable planets in just the Milky Way galaxy. Now, where do these approximations come from? They come from these new telescopes like the James Webb telescope right now that's floating somewhere there in outer space, even though I said there's no out there out there, but from a physical le list level, that's what the James Webb telescope is indicating, looking at what they call the Goldilocks zone. So if a planet is very close to its sun, um, it's too hot, no life as we know it. If it's very far away from its sun, no, li no life as we know it, too cold. But within the certain range, 60 billion habitable planets in just the Milky Way galaxy. That's now the physicalist model. But there's a quantum mechanical model, which is goes deeper. If you read uh, Sean Carroll's uh, book, Something Deeply Hidden, and Sean is a professor of uh, physics, at Caltech, he in the same he sits on the same desk as Richard Feynman, and Einstein was a visitor there. Sean Carroll, based on the quantum mechanical models, and one particular interpretation, as you know, there are thirty five interpretations of quantum mechanics, which by itself is just one equation, Schrodinger's wave function. Uh, and it's a recipe for making calculations and creating, uh, creating technologies, including the one we're using to have this conversation. So until recently, the most uh, popular interpretation of quantum mechanics was called the Copenhagen interpretation, which said that um, you need an observer to collapse the wave function into an object of experience, which we call a particle. Um, but of course, no one defines the observer or where the observer is located. I, I personally believe the observer has no location. There's no little eddy looking out of the brain through those eyes. There's no observer inside the body. The body itself is an observation. So all observers are actually non-local to begin with. But, you know, what's his name? Um, Immanuel Kant raised something even more interesting. He said, what is an object in the absence of an observer? He called it the thing in itself. And he said, uh, you know, you can never know the thing in itself because even as observation, what you're knowing is what is being reflected, as you just said. What's the thing in itself? Can just looking at this object tell me all the knowledge that's there? And he said, the thing in itself is unknown. Now, when I talk to... Um, modern day cosmologists, they say the thing in itself is spin charge and mass, which is another model for movement, transformation, and inertia, the three gunas, you know, the, the three gunas. So the thing in itself, the three gunas is this, and it's also this, which is observing this. So Immanuel Kant actually, um, stopped where the Eastern philosophers went further. Um, they said, if you, if you, if you do dharna, dhyan, samadhi on this, the thing in itself will reveal itself to you as you. Um, so there are these two models. One is the model based on cosmic, um, cosmic. Uh, appearances through telescopes, um, which are created by us. And the other is looking at the more fundamental level, quantum mechanical, where now Sean Carroll says, if you allow the Schrodinger's wave to evolve, forget the observer, then it will evolve into infinite outcomes. 
and that includes infinite observers, infinite modes of observation, and infinite universes, all within the same fundamental reality, which he would not call awareness, which he would call the Schrodinger wave function, a mathematical entity. So, you know, it's very fascinating to me that theoretical physics is based on mathematics, which is a mental activity in human consciousness. And yet uh, all these guys, including Sean and all these Nobel laureates, they actually posit physical realities independent of awareness, when in fact, even the models of Schrodinger's equation are vrittis, they exist only in awareness. Yeah, it's a paradox. So with that now, uh, are there infinite universes? Are there infinite observers? Are there infinite modes of knowing? Are you one of, in, in fact, are you all those infinite modes anyway? You know, um, uh, Yoga Vashishta, infinite universes come and go in the vast expanse of consciousness, like modes of dust dancing in a beam of light. Now that's a beautiful image. And it seems to be consistent with what we're calling metaverses or infinite metaverses. Yeah, and also your uh, what you just said about infinite points of uh, of awareness or infinite uh, observers. Um, this is absolutely what Sankhya posits. They say there are an infinite number of purushas, and each of those purushas is an observer. Um, so, very interesting. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next sutra then. Um, by practicing samyama on the sun or the solar plexus, uh, the point in the body known as the solar entrance, it's clarified as, the knowledge of the cosmic regions is acquired. So I thought I would just read a few of these cosmic regions because there are a lot of them. In fact, there are about four or five pages of cosmic regions that Vyasa is elucidating, and I'll just read off a few of them. Um, the cosmic regions, there are seven in number, starting from Avicii up to the summit of Meru in the Bhu Loka. Uh, Loka, it means a region. So there are all these different stars that are then named. Um, and of course, we know from um, the Gayatri Mantra and the Sapta Vyaratis, Om Bhu, Om Bhuvaha, Om Suvaha, Om Mahaha, Om Janaha, Om Tapaha, Ogam Satyam. These are the seven, um, seven different worlds or layers of existence. So first, all of these are named. And then um, he goes on to talk about the six great hells, which are hidden inside some of the different worlds. Um, and also these are named as Mahakala, Ambarisha, etc., where creatures are born to suffer painful long lives as um, a consequence of their accumulated sinful actions. And then after that, there are the seven nether worlds. So now we're basically going down. We, we have our plane of existence, and then below our plane is um, the seven layers, or the six great layers of darkness, and then below that, are the um, are the nether worlds even underneath that, and going all the way down to that, we come to um, sort of almost out on the other side where we go to a um, an island or seven islands with the golden king of mountains called Sumeru in the middle, and it's covered by silver and gold and emeralds. And on the account of the sheen of the emerald, the southern region of the sky looks like the leaf of a blue lotus. The eastern is white, the western bright, and the northern yellow. And then he continues to describe all of these mountains um, and how big they are for the next paragraph or so. Um, and each of them stretching over 9,000 miles or 20,000 miles in height. And then to the east of Sumeru, he starts drive, uh, describing all of the other worlds and all of the other islands, some of them that even have saltwater oceans like our own. Um, and then our, our particular planet is described. 
And then moving on from the seven oceans of our planet, we go to a, another world, which is established inside of a cosmic egg. And this egg is a minute particle of Prodano, like a firefly in the sky, of which there are infinite numbers of these minute particles of Prodano, of rays of, of, um, of the unmanifest, shining like fireflies in the sky. And then he goes on to describe all of the different Asuras and Gandharvas and Kinaras and Kimpurushas, Yakshas, Rakshasas, Bhutas, Pretas, Pishachas, um, Apasmaras, Apsaras, Brahmarakshasas, Kushmandas, and Vinayakas living in like divine beings in all of these different worlds. And then he carries on to discuss um, uh, other regions where there are beings with superpowers who have mastery over the gross elements. Um, meditation is their food. They do not need to eat food or drink any liquids for their sustenance. They live for kalpas or different eons. They have power over the elements and the organs. And then we move on to the next sphere called the tapaloka, where there are three types of devas um, or gods. Uh, God is not a good word for deva, but beings of light. Uh, they have even mastery over the tanmatras, and their longevity uh, is twice that of the former. They have full control over their passions and their intellect. And then we go to the sphere of the Satyaloka, where there are four more kinds of devas. Um, and after that, he discusses the types of beings that have total control over Pradhana, um, living all the way up to the end of the creation. So the great pralaya, when this entire creation we live in dissolves into whatever it becomes next, that these particular beings live up to that point. They enjoy the bliss, these are called the achutas, or the non-fallen. They enjoy the bliss of Savitarka meditation, um, and then the shuddha nivasas, um, enjoy the bliss of the savichara meditation, and then the satyabhas, the ananda, or the blissful meditation, etc., etc. Um, all of these seven regions come within the Brahmaloka, and, um, and there are yogis as well, who um, exist within uh, these um, disincarnated bodies that are resolved into primal matter when they reach moksha. Um, and those particular beings, the disincarnates whose bodies are resolved into primal matter, they do not reside in the phenomenal world of all the other pages that have just been described. So even outside all of these elaborate worlds are beings who exist who are not part of prakriti or any manifestation. And uh, so the yogis should practice samyama on the solar entrance, the surya dwara, the solar plexus, um, until all of these regions are seen thoroughly. And so that is this next sutra. Okay, now, uh, Eddie, uh, before I even comment, I uh, would say that nobody can beat the Indians for uh, creating maps uh, of uh, reality. These are maps of reality. These are the cartography of consciousness as described in this particular sutra. And so what um, is being described in this particular sutra is uh, states of consciousness appearing as those realities. The consciousness itself is nothing perceivable or imaginable or conceptualizable, um, being borderless, infinite. Uh, it's nothing perceivable, conceptualizable, or thinkable, or imaginable. And everything you've described right now is a projection in terms of modes of experience. However, they are very similar to the models that science describes, but science somehow excludes the experience part of it. They say, you know, independent of experience, um, there are all these different regions, dark energy, dark matter. and But even to conceptualize that, you need, you need awareness, you need consciousness. As Max Planck said, there's nothing behind consciousness. So what you're describing here is the cartography of experience. What science is describing is a model independent of experience, which is actually in a way um, you know, the basis of science. The basis of science is both subject-object split, number one, uh, which is artificial. Subject and object are the movement of consciousness. The basis of science is that 
there is a physical universe, uh, yet no one has documented a physical universe. Atoms, molecules, force fields, gravity are experiences before you can label them as such. They're modes of knowing and experience. So nevertheless, the modern models uh, of Schrodinger's wave function evolving spontaneously to an infinity of, um, of uh, universes with an infinity of sentient beings uh, is actually very close to the cartography of consciousness that you just outlined. Remembering that that cartography is always a metaphor. If you can name it, if you can see it, if you can visualize it, if you can experience it through the senses, if you can label it, describe it, imagine it, then it's a model. It's not what the reality is. You know, this is Shankaracharya's in 1880, uh, till everything is negated and all that's left is the incomprehensible, uh, infinite, irreducible, without cause, spaceless and timeless being, which is synonymous with existence, sat Chitananda. Wherever there's existence, there's existence is awareness. And existence in the unstate, undisturbed state is, um, is bliss. So Satchitananda is existence, awareness, bliss. And it's everywhere. The disturbed state is all these universes and these, these um, Brahmandis, but not one, metaverses now, infinite of them. So these are very good maps, but as you've heard, the map is never the territory, uh, the menu is never the meal. And as soon as we create maps, then actually we sacrifice uh, the territory for the map. I, you know, I can't eat the menu. I can only eat the meal, but actually thinking about the menu, you know, I'm going to eat um, um, uh, whatever, uh, spinach and uh, pizza, even thinking the word, creates the experience. My, I start to salivate, I start to feel hungry, I start to have the experience. So even though the map is not the territory, the map actually uh, creates the territory as well. It projects as the territory. And we have only human maps. You know, we don't have the cartography of consciousness of another species. In fact, the other species are also in the cartography of our consciousness, animals, rocks, planets, everything, bacteria, they're all human constructs uh, for knowing ourselves. So ultimately the light of being, the light of existence is the only light, it's the light of God, it's the divine light. And everything else is a, is a convenient metaphor and give the Indians credit for the best metaphors in terms of Sankhya and Gunas and Vrittis and all of that. Uh, but uh, it's so mysterious, ultimately, that I think uh, the last Niyama, Ishwar Pranidhana, which is surrender to this mystery without uh, trying to um, comprehend it, is the only solution because the mystery is incomprehensible. Indeed, indeed, and sometimes I, you know, I look at these um, uh, these elaborate descriptions, and also it, it, you know, we're going through all of the vibhutis of chapter three, uh, which is a chapter of Yoga Sutra which is not paid a lot of attention to by people because they think, oh, don't get lost in the vibhutis, you know, because uh, it's a distraction, but potentially had an entire chapter devoted to them for a particular reason. So we shouldn't be too dismissive in an, of an entire body of work uh, where everything else that came before it seems to be pretty useful. So even on a very mundane level, I feel that looking at the vibhutis helps to instill in the practitioner a sense of awe um, at the boundlessness of consciousness and all of the forms that it can take. When you have a sense of awe at something, um, you don't get as lost in it as you do if you're trying to claim ownership of something. 
So if you say, I want power, I want money, I want fame, I want you know, this, that, the other, you get lost in the thing that you're trying to acquire. But if you have sense, a sense of awe at a sunset or a sense of awe at a piece of music or a sense of awe by an act of kindness, you're not trying to grab that for yourself. You enjoy as the observer the beauty of it and it expands your heart, it expands your mind and it also begins to um, reduce this sense of I-ness of you know, the, the, how great I think I might be or my individual accomplishments or you know, any of the things that they call quote unquote ego you know, uh, uh, issues. Uh, ego is not a word I place much stock in but for lack of a better word, you know, word right now I'm using it. So I think this sense of awe is very important within the yoga traditions because it is places us in this realm of um, of of humbleness, you know. Um, without trying to be humble, you just feel that maybe you're a part of everything, or maybe you're observing something greater than our own individual sense of being, and that takes care of a lot of um a lot of our rough edges. If we practice awe and do things to create awe in us, a lot of our rough edges are, are smoothed out a little bit. And whether it might be anger or greed or jealousy or ambition, whatever it might be, awe helps with all of those things. And I think the vibhutis, um, if practiced properly, can contribute to that undertaking. But that's my idea on it. You know, that's very good. I'm reminded of a, a poem from Rumi it says, exchange your cleverness for bewilderment bewilderment wow. bewilderment is all and um, so you know when people say this is not practical how do i pay the mortgage um, they are in a sense actually not recognizing that uh, you know when it comes to the end of our life it doesn't really matter uh, these mortgages and everything else you're going to you're going to die as a physical body mind you you have a beginning a middle and an ending so you're going to die and uh, you know the vedanta says that all human suffering the five kleshas uh, because a you're uh, you know you don't know reality uh, two you're clinging and grasping at ephemeral transient ungraspable experiences snapshots of vrittis uh, recoiling from the same identifying with your self-image and you're afraid of death. Now, you know, if I could actually go beyond the fear of death, um, uh, then that's the most practical thing um, that can be accomplished. Uh, once you go beyond the fear of death, all fear is the fear of the unknown, where we move and live and breathe, pretending it's the known, but the known has already happened. The known is the... Uh, prison of karma. So I think these are very important insights for us to go beyond the prison of karma. And I was thinking these, you know, you, you created a very elaborate map of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the multiple universes, but same thing in the Buddhism, you know, all these regions, hungry ghosts and animals and other beings and uh, 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 sentient beings that of, divine light, etc., angels, archetypes, they're all equally real or unreal. It doesn't matter. The reality itself is incomprehensible. So I think um, pondering on these ideas does create a very interesting insight for me anyway. We are cosmic alchemists, except we are recycling the same universes over and over. And right now we are ready to transition to a new metaverse with this deeper understanding, which is also the older understanding from these wisdom traditions. Yeah, and these days we have New York, Las Vegas, and Dubai, which are all uh, constructed universes on their own. That's it. Okay, I think this was a very good conversation.